These are my friends. Well, they're pictures of my friends. And I love my friends. My friends are fantastic, and they're a bunch of wonderful people. But I miss my friends because we live in a time right now where it's really difficult for me to be able to see my friends in person. I miss being able to see my friends, and I'm sure you miss your friends too. It's really tough right now because you can't go and have fun with your friends. You can't play with your friends. I can't play with my friends, and it's tough. But I just read something that is spectacular. Jesus actually tells us that he is going to be a friend that will never leave us. I just read in Matthew that Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus makes so many wonderful promises to you and me. He promises that no matter how much we mess up, no matter how much you mess up, that he will always forgive you for everything that you've done, no matter what. And he also promises that he will never leave you. He will be a friend that will stick by your side and not even a disease like this could separate you from Jesus. So I'm going to have you fold your hands and bow your heads and I'm going to have everybody fold your hands and bow your heads and repeat after me. Jesus, thank you for always being there. We pray that you always forgive us and we thank you for always loving us. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at the gospel text, and I want to reread for you Matthew 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I find it interesting that the myriad of sermons and Bible studies that I've heard over the years that no one has ever really spent time on verse 17. It's interesting that we're so quick to want to jump to the commissioning of Jesus, and yet there's something powerful going on in verse 17 that I don't think we should be so quick to jump over and miss. And if I'm also honest, I know that I too am guilty of the fact of jumping quickly to Jesus' great commission and not spending time on verse 17. And it wasn't until recently that I really began to kind of focus on this verse to realize what's profoundly going on here and being said. And so today, we're going to be focusing on that verse primarily. I'm going to read that verse for you again. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. In reading Matthew 28, Matthew 28 is a resurrection account, and in Matthew's account of the resurrection, Jesus appears to the women. And what's interesting is that in Matthew's account, the rest of the disciples don't see the resurrected Jesus until Galilee. Okay, and that's how Matthew sets up his gospel. And so we transition to Galilee. Galilee is a well-known place. Jesus spent a lot of time there, right, did a lot of ministry there. And it's there in Galilee that the disciples see Jesus, and immediately their response is to worship. But then we get this very interesting nugget there at the end of verse 17 where it says, But some doubted. They all worshipped, but some doubted doubted. Now, what's interesting here is that worship and doubt seem to be at odds with each other, right? Because we think, well, worship entails belief, and how is it that some doubt and yet they still worship? I think we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful here on thinking that belief and doubt are polar opposites of each other. And so what I want to do is I want to spend some time talking about doubt. Um, for starters, I think we have to understand doubt from really kind of two perspectives. We understand doubt from those who are skeptics, right? Those who doubt from a place of sin versus those who doubt from a place of faith. So let's talk first and foremost about 
skeptics. Skeptics are those like the atheists, are like those like agnostics, are those who abjectly refuse to believe in Jesus, reject his claims or who he is. They reject his grace and his forgiveness. And in doing in that rejection, you have to understand that they are committing the sin, the unforgivable sin in Scripture. The unforgivable sin is a sin that Jesus says is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's the sin of unbelief. You might say, well, why is it unforgivable? Well, here's a reason why. If you are rejecting God's grace and forgiveness for you, then you are rejecting the very means by which you are forgiven. So how can you be forgiven if you're rejecting that forgiveness? Now, I don't believe, by the way, that these people are always then condemned in that. The the history of the Christian church has been there have been a lot of people who were atheists who then became believers. C.S. Lewis is an example of one of them, right? So it is possible for people to no longer be in that condition of of engaging in the sin of non-belief and therefore engaging in the unforgivable sin. But those who remain consistent and persistent in rejecting Jesus find themselves in that state of the unforgivable sin. So what about those who are doubting from a place of faith? For starters, I think about the father in Mark 9. This is one of my favorite stories. Let me set up Mark 9 for you. Jesus actually, in in the beginning of that, is up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. It's a mount of transfiguration that's going on. You probably know that story, what's happening there. They come down off the mountain, and when they get down off the mountain, Jesus finds his other disciples engaged in in a debate. There's a father that had brought his demon-possessed son to them, and they were unable to cast out that demon. And so this father pleads with Jesus and says to Jesus, if you are able to. And Jesus stops him and says, if. Don't you know that all things are possible with God? And then the father has this beautiful confession, by the way, that has become even my own prayer throughout my own journey of faith. And he says this, I believe, help my unbelief. Think about that. I believe. Help my unbelief. It's a father who doubts from a position of faith. And I think also, by the way, that's where we see our disciples here in the narrative of Matthew 28. Those disciples who come and they worship, and yet there's some of them who are slack-jawed and open-eyed, and they're rubbing their eyes, and they're pinching themselves, and they're looking at each other and say, do you see what I see? Yeah, I see what you see. Why? Because he was dead, and now he's risen again, standing in front of them. And then again, their immediate response is one of worship. And you have to understand what is meant by the word worship there is worship in that that word are those who are throwing themselves on the ground. Those who are not just on their knees, really, but maybe even the face planted in the dirt. It's also that term, I love it, it's very interesting. That term also carries with it the idea of a dog uh, licking the hand of their master. When I think about that concept of that Greek term there, (laughs) I think maybe for better or for worse, those of you who are into yoga, I think of the downward dog position, right? What what an image of the idea of worship of what's happening here in regards to these disciples. They worship. I don't think this is from a place of non-belief that those are doubting. I think this is from a place of belief. And here's the other thing too as well. Is why I think this strengthens the idea that they're coming from a doubting from a place of faith is what happens in the verses following verse 17. Jesus gives his commissioning to all of them. Jesus sends them out to be ambassadors of faith, all of them. It's not like Jesus said, well, you know what, John? Matthew, Andrew, Philip, you come on over here. Yeah, you come over here. You guys are okay. You guys can listen to what I'm about to say. 
no, the rest of you need to stay over there. Yeah, Peter, especially you, you need to stay over there. James, you've never been my brother who wants to listen to me, right? Uh, Oh, and Thomas, definitely, you need to stay away. You guys aren't ready to hear what I'm going to tell you. Jesus commissions them all, doubters and all, to be ambassadors of the faith, of the good news that's going on here. So why is all this significant? Why is all of this powerful? Why is all this something that really needs to be speaking to us today? I imagine that some of you this morning when you logged on to come to worship, that you find yourself in a place of doubt. Maybe the whole pandemic or the economic downturn that we're dealing with has got you to kind of question God's goodness. Maybe you're like the prophet Habakkuk or even the psalmist who says, How long, O Lord, how long? And yet here you are. You've come to worship. You've come to receive from the Lord. You might be doubting, but you're not doubting from a place of unbelief. You're doubting from a place of faith. You have to realize that doubting is actually part of the journey of faith. Pretty much the majority of the saints that we read about in Scripture doubted. And I think think powerfully, by the way, of the term Israel and, and what's going on with that term. Because that term, I think, actually speaks to the situation that we deal with with doubt. You might remember that story in the Old Testament. This is Jacob, right? Jacob, one night, he finds himself in a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord. That the result of the end of that night was a bad hip, as well as a name change. His name goes from Jacob to Israel, and, and the title Israel means one who wrestles with God. Brothers and sisters, you have to understand that that title is also applied to us. We also are Israel as believers in Jesus. We are people who still wrestle with God. And one of the ways that we wrestle with God is in our doubts. I also think that when we are honest with our doubts, that we can find ourselves being empathetic with the skeptical disbelievers who we work with, who we live beside, who we go to school with, who are in our own families. You see, there's a beauty with Jesus giving his commissioning to those doubters. I like to think that those who are doubters on that mountain, that they use that experience in their engagement with the disbelievers that they talk to. I can imagine them saying something like this. Yeah, I know you have a hard time with the resurrection. I know you have a hard time wrapping your mind around somebody who was crucified and risen from the dead again. Guess what? I saw him with my own eyes, and I still doubt it. This empathetic approach, I think, echoes best the words of the Sri Lankan evangelist D.T. Niles, who wrote that, we are beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. Our position as faithful doubters does not give us some sort of advantage over those doubting disbelievers. Rather, in truth, we are all spiritually impoverished people who so desperately need the bread of life. And those who have found it, us, can point to others where they too can find that bread of life. Also, and more importantly, our being empathetic with the skeptics is something that we see Jesus do. It's rooted in Jesus. You might recall a Friday that we call good. It was about midday, and the clouds came about. Darkness came over the land, and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? The cry, the why, is the cry of all of history. It's the cry of all people everywhere. 
Our own questioning cry to the sky is answered in Jesus' own questioning cry from the cross. You know, this insight came upon me a number of years back when I was called to conduct the funeral service of one of my former youth from my days and when I served at First Lutheran Church in Burbank. His name was Kevin Butcher, and he was in his mid-20s. And it was a week, the Sunday actually, right after Easter, that he was riding his Ducati motorcycle, coming from Santa Monica on the 10 freeway with a buddy. And his buddy was on his motorcycle in front of him, and his buddy stopped his motorcycle really suddenly. And Kevin didn't stop in time, and he slammed into his buddy, and he was thrown from his bike. When he hit his pavement, Kevin's neck was snapped immediately and he died. I'll never forget the funeral service as I was in the church and the church was standing room only. The majority, majority of the people there, as you can believe, were young adults since Kevin himself was one. And majority of those young people were, were disbelievers and so I had a privilege and an honor to be able to preach the gospel to them. And I knew a lot of them would be there in light of this tragedy with question cries of their own. I know it might sound odd to say that this, their questions and yours are answered in Jesus' question, but let me explain. It's the cross where God reveals himself to the world. Not in a place of power, but in a place of weakness. A place where he went to identify most intimately with humanity. With humanity's doubts. With humanity's pains. With humanity's sin. It's a place where Jesus went to identify most intimately with you with your own doubts, with your own pains, with your own sins. Even Jesus' own questioning cry from the cross, by the way, for us, reframes, redeems our own times of questioning. Being in Christ that we are through our baptism means among many things, but it also means that we have the privilege to approach our Father in heaven as sons and daughters, to ask our own questions. And any parent who has small children right now or who has had small children knows that children like to ask a lot of questions. And when children are in a loving relationship with their parents, they know that they can come to their parent and they can ask any question because of, out of trust of their parents. You know, it's Luther scholars that believe this is what drove Luther in his small catechism to ask the repeated question, what does this mean? In German, was ist das is a child question. What is this? And we can just imagine Luther and his big family and the kids all saying to, to Papa Luther, was ist das? Was ist das? Was ist das? What is this? What is this? What is this? Our empathetic great commissioning work with the skeptics means that we can share with them that being Christian doesn't mean that the questions and doubts go away. Rather, being Christian means that by God's grace, we can see through the doubts. It means that we can continue to ask those questions from that place of grace. We ask those questions to a loving father who listens, who is patient with us, who does not reject us when we come to worship with our doubts, rather invites us to come, mixed bag and all that we are, so that we may receive once again in word and in sacrament the grace that we so desperately need, the grace that we need to strengthen us in our faith, to strengthen us in our questioning, to strengthen us in our doubts. And to be reminded, as Jesus reminds his disciples in verse 20, that he is with them always, that he is with you always. 
and your questions and your doubts until the very end of the age. In Jesus, amen.